another video on Carl Gustav Jung. All right, so in this video, we're going to talk about Jung's four stages of life. It could be also called the problems of life. Okay, so I've got this information from uh, an essay that he published called The Stages of Life in 1930. Uh, and he basically, it's in the Collected Works, Volume 8, so you can get it there. But it was also published in the book Modern Man in Search of a Soul in 1933. So you'll find it there as well if you want to read it. But I'm going to give you a quick rundown of what you kind of need to know before we get into the four stages because um, there's kind of a build-up to him talking about the four stages of life. Uh, so basically, Jung's content, he always talks about a contrast between the unconscious and the conscious. And so in this text, he's breaking down the, this distinction and this, this problems that arise in life um, because of this kind of dichotomy of the, the psyche. And so basically uh, in the unconscious, he, he says that there's no problems really, um, but it's only when we have consciousness that problems arise. Okay, so um, he basically says here that he's not going to talk about the the normal occurrences in the various stages. He's just going to talk about certain problems. And um, he basically, he says that everything he's going to say should always be open to doubt. Okay, so um, we should always, uh, to question, um, allow more than allow more than one answer and allow those answers also to be subject to doubt as well okay so he says now and then we must even indulge in speculations and that's because of the subject matter that we're talking about when you're talking about the unconscious and the conscious you can't really always nail it down with accuracy so you you do make specul um, speculations but you do that using the knowledge and understanding that we have at hand, okay? So, and the observations um, f from life and from history as well. And so, here there's that, the, this dichotomy um, that it is the growth of consciousness which we must thank for the existence of problems, okay? So, um, it is just man's turning away from instinct He's opposing himself to instinct that creates consciousness. So basically, Jung talks a lot about instinct. And so it's as if man who is natural man, who is pure instinct, like the animals, has turned away from instinct. And as he has turned away from instinct, he has developed a consciousness. And then with that consciousness, he has develop problems because he is now conscious of problems but he also now has a problem which is consciousness itself um, and 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 the the tension and dichotomy that consciousness creates between unconsciousness and instinct because he says here there is he um, it's his opposing himself to instinct so it's as if in man he he is opposing himself there's an inner conflict now um, inside himself between instinct and his conscious mind. Okay, so not only does consciousness bring to our awareness the problems of everyday world of, of the everyday world and and different things like obstacles and and threats to our life, but it also brings in another problem, which is the, the conflict with our nature, with the 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 instinct of man. Okay, so. Instinct is nature and seeks to perpetuate nature, whereas consciousness can only seek culture or its denial. That's what Jung says. So basically, nature uh, is self-evident. There's self-evident facts in the unconscious. Okay, um, 
because there is a certainty, a security, a guidance. It is, we're just relying on pure instinct, okay? Uh, there is no divergent thinking. There is no other way to do things. We are just kind of anchored into instinct. But with consciousness, we have now rational thought and, and, and we can do experiments. Um, we have reflections. So there's multiple things that could be true, um, multiple things that we could focus on that lead us in different directions. That's why there's divergent ways of thinking, okay? With, with, with consciousness, there's multiple things we could focus on and do. Um, and things that seem true in different directions. But with instinct, we're guided only in one kind of way. You know, the instinct just, just guides us kind of blindly into something. You know, um, but with consciousness, we can reflect, we can think, we can do experiments and test things. Um, and, that, and with consciousness, we don't know what to do exactly because we are aware that we don't know so much. We are aware that there is aspects of us that are unconscious and that brings doubt and fear. Um, and this is necessary. It is necessary to have doubt. In fact, having doubt in a sense is, is healthy for consciousness. It's healthy for consciousness. Um, it, you're always gonna have that tension. Doubt um, fuels that tension between what we don't know, which is what we're unconscious of, and what we do know, but it allows us not to get too rigid in our consciousness. It allows us not to get too rigid or dogmatic with um, being too certain about things because we can't be certain because our consciousness doesn't is missing out everything that's in the unconscious, you see? And so doubt is a healthy disposition towards consciousness because it allows us to make reflections and experiments. And experiments, Jung says, um, are what we shy away from because what that is, is it's testing things, it's going into the darkness because you, you form a hypothesis you know, in, in, with your consciousness, but then you go and test it. So you're, you're doing something, you're basically going into the darkness and bringing back information. And so um, that's where we can seek to update our consciousness on the things that we do not know. Um, Whereas in the unconscious there, you could do a, um, a, a sturdy empiricism on the, 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 I guess, the causal instinctual um, chain um, that, that has taken place before our consciousness arised. But with consciousness, we can't do that. We have to have experiments. And so um, Jung says that unconsciousness seeks nature. It seeks the, the, you know, obviously instinctually we are, you know, through sex and other means, we are seeking the continuation of nature, whereas consciousness, we are seeking culture. And so um, that is, that also means something specific to Jung as well, I believe. This word culture, it comes up again throughout this text. Okay, so that is kind of the framework we're dealing with um, that Jung outlines in his text um, before we get into the actual problems of life because there's this dichotomy between these two poles of the psyche happening here. Um, and so he says, even if we turn back to nature, inspired by a Rousseau-esque longing, we cultivate nature. So even the fact that we have consciousness now, if we try to go back to nature, we will just end up cultivating it. Um, and Rousseau obviously is famous for his ideas of the natural man being pure and culture corrupting us and stuff like that. So Jung's addressing that there. Um, and it's interesting in the Garden of Eden, um, just the note here that God doesn't like bush. He likes garden. So therefore, you know, God representing, I guess, consciousness in a sense, um, and the garden representing the, the culture of nature, you know, the, cultiva the um, cultivation of nature. And so, you know, God doesn't like bush. He, he wants a garden and, and human beings were there to tend the garden. And so you can see that parallel there between consciousness and unconsciousness or, or um, culture and nature. Okay, so 
Every problem, therefore, brings the possibility of a widening of consciousness, but also the necessity of saying goodbye to childlike unconsciousness and trust in nature. So we've turned against our instincts, we've, we've turned away from the childlike trust that we have in just relying on our instincts, and now we are pursuing a widening of consciousness. And every time we encounter a problem, like the snake in the Garden of Eden is a problem, then now we have the uh, access to a widening of our understanding and perception um, uh, of, of, of greater consciousness. Um, and each problem that we encounter does that, does that for us in real life too, throughout your life. You encounter different problems and challenges and they open up your understanding. That's how we grow in our awareness and in our consciousness. Um, and Jung says here, the biblical four of man presents the dawn of consciousness as a curse. And that's exactly how we experience it. If we're aware of stuff and we're more conscious of things, there's this curse-like element to it because we're now aware that we have to struggle and work. We're now aware that we have to you know, give birth and we're aware of our pain and, and our suffering even more so than just the physicality of it. We are now consciously aware of it. The artful denial of a problem would not produce conviction. On the contrary, a wider and higher consciousness is required to give us the certainty and clarity we need. That's why Jung loves to tackle these things and, you know, uh, speculate about the unconscious. Because that's the only way we're going to be able to bring back an understanding of it. Okay, so um, because that is the dichotomy here. We can't claim that we know everything and therefore we have to speculate. Uh, we have to be willing to do experiments. We have to be willing to understand more about what we don't understand. Um, and we can't pretend that we know everything, otherwise we get rigid in our understanding. For it is out of himself and out of his peculiar constitution that man has produced his sciences. They are symptoms of his psyche. So Jung talks about playing around in all the different fields. So we must dabble around and upset the theologian. We must upset the, um, the biologist, the psychologist, the, uh, the historian, you know, um, all that stuff. So he plays around in all different fields because he's trying to piece together an understanding of the unconscious and consciousness. Okay, so Jung now moves on from um, this and he says, why does man in obvious contrast to the animal world have problems at all? Okay, and he says, well, we need to reframe um, that question because um, obviously we have, we don't have problems without consciousness. So we need to go to consciousness and be like, okay, well, how does consciousness arise in the first place? Because obviously, some reason consciousness is causing problems so we need to understand more about consciousness and how it arose in the first place and so therefore he he says we can observe small children in the process of becoming conscious so he basically says we don't really know how it exactly comes to be but we can observe small children coming into consciousness okay um, and he basically says when the child recognizes someone or something when he knows a person or thing then we feel that the child has consciousness okay so the child would be like, oh, butterfly. And we'd be like, oh, well, obviously the kid knows that that's a butterfly, you know? So, um, so it's, and he says here that no doubt is also why in paradise, it was the tree of knowledge, which bore such fateful fruit. So obviously in Genesis, there is the, when uh, Adam and Eve eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So the tree of knowledge, um, it, it brought to them consciousness. So the knowingness brought them consciousness. Okay. Um, so we speak of knowing something when we succeed in linking a new perception to an already existing context in such a way that we hold in consciousness, not only the perception, but parts of this context as well. Knowing is based therefore upon the perceived connection between psychic contents. We can have no knowledge of a content that is not connected with anything. 
and we cannot even be conscious of it should our consciousness still be on this low initial level. So there needs to be a connection between something. There needs to be at least two things that come together um, for you to be able to know something. Okay. According, accordingly, the first stage of consciousness, which we can observe, consists in the mere connection between two or more psychic contents. Okay. So you're perceiving, but you're also um, connecting that perception to something, and that's how you know. Okay. Um, and then as the kid grows, um, the kid, the children, they develop, they, their perceptions are then linked to, are then stored in memory. Okay. So then they get a development of themselves. Okay. So it's not just pure perception, but it's perception and then a memory of those perceptions, which eventually create what would be an ego or this I-ness or I, because I now have the memories of all the perceptions that I have had, um, you know, and so it's something like that. So there's all these different elements that go into developing that consciousness and ego as, as time um, progresses. And we've learned a lot more since Jung wrote this, but um, this is his thoughts and ideas anyway, back in 1930. Um, so then we move now to, that's basically stage one, okay? is um, the unconscious or, or the, is basically when you're a child. And so Jung basically says when you're a child, you don't really have any problems of your own. Um, so he kind of doesn't talk much about this stage of life. He kind of skips over it. Um, but this is one of the stages is when you're a child. Okay. So in the childish stage of consciousness, there are yet no problems. Nothing depends upon the subject for the child itself is still wholly dependent on its parents. It is as though it were not yet completely born, but were still enclosed in the psychic atmosphere of its parents, psychic birth, and with it, the conscious differentiation from the parents normally takes place only at puberty with the eruption of sexuality. The physiological change is attended by a psychic revolution. So basically, he's talking about the ego is slowly building as the child becomes more conscious as the child develops. It is kind of in this mist and, and, and convoluted, tangled up with the psyche of the parents and those around the child. And then so um, they don't really have problems of their own, but the problems they do have are just a result of the parents' influence um, on their psyche. And then slowly as the, the child develops more consciousness and then through the eruption of sexuality, there is a massive change, um, obviously a physiological change, and then that then substantiates the ego um, and, and, and makes the, um, the ego more stable because now obviously there is more of me. Oh, look at me. I have become this. You know, this is what's happening to me. My body is changing. You know, and, and um, that sexuality kind of solidifies the ego and, and helps push a person to develop their ego um, in that way. Um, but they're still developing it as they go on as well. Okay, so until this period is reached, the psychic life of the individual is governed largely by instinct and few or no problems arise. Even when external limitations oppose his subjective impulses, these restraints do not put the individual at variance with himself. He submits to them or circumvents them, remaining quite at one with himself. Okay, so there's this oneness in the unconscious, whereas there's this division in consciousness. Okay, so he's still one with himself as a child. Um, and there's no problems that arise, even through external kind of circumstances. Um, Jung says that um, the child kind of circumvents them or kind of assimilates them and they're still at one with themselves because they're unconscious ultimately. So it's like the unconscious is still dealing with them and dealing with their problems, okay? Because they haven't arisen to full maturity and consciousness. Um, so he does not yet know the state of inattention induced by a problem. This state only arises when what was an external limitation becomes an inner one, when one impulse is opposed by another. That's a key line, okay? So he's not just talking about, when I first read this book, I thought, you know, 
I read it quickly and I just thought about the different stages and it felt weird to me. But when you read really closely, look, Jung's talking about something else. He's talking about this dichotomy between these two poles. It's very important to pick that up. And so I'll read this again. He does not yet know the state of inattention induced by a problem, which is that consciousness arose out of unconsciousness. And there's this opposing to instinct and this conscious mind that seeks culture to create something. Okay. And so that inattention between those two things, um, that is not yet developed because um, this state only arises when what was an external limitation becomes an inner one. So it's, it's not an inner limitation yet because the child is not fully conscious. You know, some of this would be, a little example would be like a child's not worried about what he has to do for work, okay? Because that's not an inner problem that the child wrestles with. He's still living in unconscious, just, you know, fantasy world. What do you want to be when you grow up? Well, I can be anything, you know? So, um, but uh, obviously with consciousness, a greater level of awareness of the world, that then a lot of adults are struggling with that. What am I going to do for work? What am I going to do? You know, so that, that's an example there, okay? Um, so, but ultimately we are talking about the tension between the opposites, Okay. Um, and that inner problem of this tension between two personalities, the unconscious personality and the conscious personality. That's ultimately what Jung is getting at here. Um, an example, the emergence of the self in conflict with the ego. Okay. And so we'll get more into that soon. Um, but what I want to say here is that we're still on the first stage with children, okay, with being a child, okay, and then uh, the second stage then is from puberty to 35 to 40 years old, okay, so from puberty to 35 to 40 years old, that's stage two, okay, but in looking at these four life stages, there's three steps of consciousness leading to this, this problem that we're talking about here, which is the tension of opposites. This is really what Jung's talking about, um, he's illustrating this He's, he's talking about these three stages within the four stages of life, like the external four stages of life, okay? So um, these three stages are, um, obviously the beginning part, the, record, the, the knowingness that I was talking about from the chaotic state of one to two, so two points connecting, that's obviously the remnants, the beginning of consciousness, you know, um, and then as, um, more connections make place then we build and develop what he calls the ego complex okay so there's multiple points of um of perceptions and memory um coming together to form a complex or a personality which we would call the ego which is the the nearest and dearest complex that a human has which we identify as ourself okay and so the beginning is a chaotic state where you're not really conscious, but you're kind of forming random associations. And then there's more of a stability in the personality where you know who you are as a person, what you've done, your biography. And that's known as the um, monarchic or monistic state. Um, you know, your ego, you still, you want to submit things to your will um, and you want to seek out pleasure. Okay, and then the third state is um, awareness of the divided, so the dualistic state. So awareness of this problem, awareness of the inner tension between the self, which is an unconscious personality that you have, and your ego, which is your conscious personality that you've developed from associations and interactions of the world. Okay, and so um, the third state of um, this divided state is um, also known as... Um, instead of just I-ness, it's also known as also I. So I have two personalities. This, this is also me as well. You know, but the ego wants to reject that because it becomes rigid, rigid and stagnant and doesn't want to take on anything foreign or strange um, into itself. But um, this dualistic state is a realization of, oh, well, that is also a part of me. You know, this other personality and that tension between your ego and the self is what Jung is really talking about through these life stages. Okay, so stage two, like I said, is um, from puberty to 25 to 30, year, uh, sorry, from puberty to 35 to 40 years old. Okay, and so he calls stage two, um, the second stage of life, 
uh, the period of youth. Okay, so you're, you're beyond a child now, your sexuality has erupted, um, your ego has begun to, begun to form a stronger associations of itself in a, in a firmer identity, and now um, you're in what Jung calls the period of youth. Okay, so um, we, are, we are all familiar with the sources of the problems that arise in the period of youth. Okay, for most people, it is the demands of life which harshly put an end to the dream of childhood. If the individual is sufficiently well prepared, the transition to a profession or career can take place smoothly. But if he clings to illusions that are contrary to reality, then problems will surely arise. So obviously, that's a very common um, problem that we can see today. Um, and I think this is also uh, kind of gives an understanding of why someone like Jordan Peterson is so popular for um, younger people is because they are struggling because of the demands of life. And he's saying, clean up your room, get your stuff together, um, and you know, transition over to a professional career, make something of yourself, tra tra um, transition over into making something of yourself in the world. Okay, and so Jung's basically saying, you know. What happens here is that the demands of life break our childhood perceptions. It's no longer, what can I be when I grow up? It's really like, what can I actually do in life? Okay. And so um, Jung says that it's when we cling to the illusions, you know, or have many different kinds of false assumptions about life because we're younger and we, you know, many people have false assumptions about a whole bunch of things. And, and you might think, oh, I've got no false assumptions, I'm doing fine, I'm working, but yet your relationships are bad. You might have so many false assumptions about what it is like to actually interact with someone or live with someone or something like that. So relationships, work, this external world, um, the demands of life, these are the things Jung is talking about here, um, mainly through having some type of illusion or false assumption about reality. So there's a discrepancy between your inner understanding of what's actually going on in the external world, okay? And that discrepancy is making you behave in ways which aren't conducive towards success or aren't conducive towards making a way for you that is stable within the world and society, okay? So often it is a question of exaggerated expectations, underestimation of difficulties, unjustified optimism or a negative attitude and I believe I've manifested all of them in a certain way not so much a negative attitude but sometimes okay so I'm sure we can all relate to that okay um, but it is not always the contradiction between subjective assumptions and external facts that give rise to problems it may just as often be inner psychic difficulties they may exist even when things run smoothly in the outside world, okay? So um, he talks about things like, well, here it is. These inner problems, okay, very often it is the disturbance of psychic equilibrium caused by the sexual instinct. Equally often it is the feeling of inferiority which springs from an unbearable sensitivity, okay? So um, there you can see Jung is hinting at these two inner problems, the sexual instinct or inferiority and they they are references to Freud and Adler okay Freud with the sexual theory Adler with the power principle which also is probably derived from Nietzschean thinking as well um, so I want to also read this quote by Joseph Campbell um, from the introduction to the book um, the portable Jung okay which he compiled you know a, a book with uh, all the different different sections of Jung so you can read and kind of build up on the concepts um, and prepare yourself for the collected works. So Jung terms extroversion, the trend of libido recognized by Freud, which is characterized by an openness. One might even say vulnerability of the subject to the object. Thinking, feeling and acting in relation willy nilly to the claims or appeal of the object. Okay. So um, he's talking about Freud is linked to extroversion somehow. Okay, so we've got our own ideas about extroversion, introversion. Anyway, I'll continue the quote. Introversion, on the other hand, is the trend recognized by Adler, which is characterized by a concentration of interest 
in the subject, thinking, feeling, and acting in relation primarily to the interests, concerns, aims, feelings, and thought processes of oneself. Okay, so there, Joseph Campbell characterizes Jung and his ideas of extroversion and introversion and associates them with Freud and Adler. And I wanted to bring that up because um, I think that adds some more to what Jung is saying here, where Jung is saying not only are there problems with integration in the world um, in, the in the period of youth, but there's also these other problems um, of sexual instinct and inferiority. So he's, he's, he's mentioning Freud and Adler because they're the, the main other contenders and ideas at that time. Okay, And so um, basically, you know, what Freud's talking about, what Adler's talking about, they're also problems that we encounter um, in times of youth, okay? Um, so, he also said that young people who struggle hard for existence, so find it hard to integrate in the world and had a kind of a tough life, they're kind of spared this these inner problems of problems with their own um, sex life or problems with feeling inferior or wanting to have power and stuff like that okay so they're kind of spared those inner problems but they might have had problems still integrating into the world or whatever or being successful okay um and it, and that's why he mentioned those people who have successfully transitioned into the world they have a job they have a wife whatever they might still have these other inner problems of of sex or that freud talks about or um, of inferiority of inferiority um, and, and wanting um, to submit things to your will and to have um, power you know and so they're the two things um, you know sex is the ego the reason why Jung's saying this is because in the period of youth people normally cling to their ego which either with sex wants gratification and pleasure just just wants to kind of indulge in frivolous pleasure or wants to um, Kind of gain power and submit everything to my will. It's a very ego-driven thing, you know. Um, my I want to submit these things to my will, you know. That springs out of a place of inferiority. Okay, so the, all those things are talking about a consciousness which has developed a rigid type of um, ego complex, and that's going to make it hard to connect with the self. Okay, so these are inner problems um, within this stage of life. Something in us wishes to remain a child and to be unconscious or at most conscious only of the ego. Okay, so um, to reject every strange or else um, or else subject it to our will to do nothing or else indulge our own um, craving for pleasure or power. Okay. Um, so he's basically saying we will reject the self or everything strange and weird that doesn't really coincide with our ego And if we don't reject it, we're going to subject it to our will because we're seeking power We want to dominate. We want to understand everything um, um, Or in this stage of life, we want to do nothing You know because we actually what we're seeking Jung is saying is we're seeking to be unconscious again We don't want to reach we don't want to hold the tension of opposites so we can smash it and make a higher consciousness. Instead, we want to um, kind of lay low in our consciousness and, and we seek to go back into the unconscious realm. That's why we have problems with drugs and all this stuff. We get lost in sex. We get lost in, in trying to pursue power and gratify our ego and look good in front of other people and stuff like that. Instagram, all that bullshit, you know, so, you know, um, that's what Jung's talking about here, you know, this infantile um, shrinking away from consciousness and wanting to kind of either do nothing, which I can relate to, I understand, it's like come home, you just want to do nothing, you know, you want to be unconscious, you want to just mindlessly watch some game or do something, you know, you want to be unconscious, you know, and, and that's what he's saying, we want to, we're clinging to the earlier stage of wanting to be a child, and the child is what? The child is unconscious. So the problems we have in the second stage of life, the, the, the period of youth, um, is largely derived from wanting to cling to childhood and, and wanting to be um, unconscious. Okay, so um, 
a more or less patent clinging to the childhood level of consciousness, a resistance to the fateful forces in and around us, which would involve us in the world. Yes, so we resist wanting to be involved in the world, okay? That's some of the th problems that we have in the second stage, okay? Because, again, think about the three phases of development that he was talking about. Just a little bit of consciousness develops, then there's the ego, then there's the dualistic state. And so in the, the second stage of life, in the period of youth from, you know, um, puberty to 35 to 40, we're still developing our ego. And all those problems I just mentioned are problems with um, developing the ego, but also problems of being stuck in the ego. So Jung basically says here, um, in this great passage somewhere, um, basically that it'd be ideal if you could integrate the self and the ego in this second stage, okay? But it's not really normally possible for people because of the demands of life. So they, because the world does not care about um, you developing yourself and the ego, the tension between those things, dealing with that inner problem, the deep human problem that we have. And so it is possible in this stage of life, in the period of youth, where we're young, to, uh, I guess, reach what Jung would call individuation. You know, uh, let me just read some quotes here. For here, the individual is faced with the necessity of recognizing and accepting what is different and strange as a part of his own life, as a kind of also I. So what he's talking about the dualistic phase, which he says can happen in the period of youth, but often doesn't. And then it can happen and, meant, and it's meant to happen in the third stage, which is the adult years, which is after 40, up until old age. Um, and obviously a lot of people die without um, integrating these two things anyway. But... Um, he says it is possible while you're younger. The essential feature of the dualistic phase is the widening of the horizon of life. And it is that, and it is this that is so vigorously resisted. So we have this resistance in our ego um, to, to um, reach this kind of dualistic phase where we're integrating the self and the ego and that tension between um, that inner conflict of a turning away from the instinct and a seeking for culture. Um, so to be sure, this expansion or diastole, as uh, Goethe called it, had started long before this. It begins at birth when the child abandons the narrow confinement of the mother's body. And from then on, it steadily increases until it reaches a climax in the problematical state when the individual begins to struggle against it. So this whole process um, of this dualistic phase is has been has always been developing ever since we were born but it just hits a climax when we're older you know and depending on who you are that will you know depending on your integration of these things um, you know I guess will determine when when um, that climax will hit okay so Jung sums this up nicely here when he says Whoever protects, them, whoever protects himself against what is new and strange and regresses to the past falls into the same neurotic condition as the man who identifies himself with the new and runs away from the past. The only difference is that the one has estranged himself from the past and the other from the future. In principle, both are doing the same thing. They are reinforcing their narrow range of consciousness instead of shattering it in the tension of opposites and building up a state of wider and higher consciousness. So Jung's goal here is to um, maintain that tension between the opposites, between the self, the second personality, and the ego, the first personality, and to um, have that tension reach a climax so it shatters, and then you receive a higher level of consciousness and understanding um, through that process of the psyche. Of integration of the opposites okay um, this outcome would be ideal if it could be brought about in the second stage of life but there's the rub 
For one thing, nature cares nothing whatsoever about a higher level of consciousness, quite the contrary. And then, society does not value these facts of the psyche very highly, or these feats of the psyche very highly, sorry. Uh, its prizes are always given for achievement and not for personality, the latter being rewarded for the most part posthumously. So, society doesn't care about your psychological feats. They don't care about how enlightened or integrated you are as a human being. You know, uh, I mean, sometimes they do, but very rarely. They mainly care about money, usefulness, effectiveness. And so Jung is saying here, culture, uh, nature doesn't, uh, society doesn't care about it, and nature definitely doesn't care about it, because nature just wants to propagate, um, just wants instinct to, to keep going and taking its place. Okay, so um, that's that there. Um, so these facts compel us towards a particular solution. So considering the fact that nature doesn't care about this higher, wider consciousness. Society doesn't care about this higher, wider consciousness. Um, this compels us to a particular solution, and we are forced to limit ourselves to the attainable. So this is what most people do, okay? And to differentiate particular aptitudes in which the socially effective individual discovers his true self. Okay, so normally what people do is they just do what is attainable, what they actually can do, and in, say, getting a job or in doing that or this or marrying this person, we differentiate particular aptitudes. So we try to specialize in different um, things. So we develop different skills in different areas. We develop our personality in different ways through these attainable experiences that we can um, obtain throughout our life, right? And as we um, kind of create a little niche for, our, for ourselves, so... Uh, in society, so if we're socially effective, we create a little place for our, ourselves in society. Um, hopefully, through doing that and through um, you know developing ourselves and our life, we can eventually discover our true self. Okay, through doing that. But um, okay, and so he says here, achievement, usefulness, and so forth are the ideals that seem to point the way out of the confusions of the problematical state. They are the lodestars that guide us in the adventures of broadening and consolidating our physical existence. They help us to strike our roots in the world. Okay? So that's like kind of what Jordan Peterson is talking about. You know, clean up your room, you know, make something of yourself, achieve something, become useful, you know, be formidable, you know, this normally guides you out, you know, take responsibility. This normally guides you out of the problematical state of who am I and what am I doing, you know. But, um, and, and that is very good, it's a good thing. But they cannot guide us in the development of that wider consciousness to which we give the name of culture. See, he brings up that word culture again. It's really weird, he associates that wider consciousness so after the shattering of the tension between the opposites and 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 between the first and second personality he he associates this, this wider level of consciousness that you can obtain with which we give the name culture which is really weird you know i mean it's strange i mean that kind of reminds me of the kingdom of god or something like that but um yeah, we have to get back to that. I'll look into that later, but I've, I noted it, that he, he uses that word culture in relation to this higher consciousness. So it's, it's, it's interesting there. In the period of youth, however, this course is the normal one, and in all circumstances preferable to merely tossing about in a welter of problems. So it's the normal way to just take responsibility, okay? That's um, the normal way that we can kind of progress forward in our life. I kind of picture him saying it's kind of like a walking stick. It's a crutch. It will help you like a certain part of the way, but it's not all there is. Okay. There is, because he said, um, you know, making roots, he's saying this helps us strike our roots in the world, but he says, but this can't guide us. 
It cannot guide us in the development of that wider consciousness. So basically what happens is, is this achievement, this usefulness helps us build our ego. It helps us um, integrate ourselves into the world and it can actually help us develop a lot of our personality and strengthen that ego side, um, which is good and healthy, but it doesn't, it doesn't really integrate the self and, and it doesn't really like connect those. I mean, the hope is that it does. The hope is that it kind of does. It, it's leading you to doing that because it is, you are developing through integrating yourself into the world. You're developing into a formidable human being, but it is kind of one-sided as well. It's, it's cause it's outward focused. It's for the world. You see what I mean? Um, so the dilemma is often solved therefore in this way. Okay. Still talking about this solution. Whatever is given to us by the past is adapted to the possibilities and demands of the future. We limit ourselves to the attainable, and this means renouncing all other psychic potentialities. Okay, So we limit ourselves to a niche, a work, a profession, a thing in life that we do. And then that, in limiting ourselves, we are able to kind of move forward and gain structure out of this problematical state that we're experiencing through this dichotomy of the tension of opposites, okay? Because we're like, who are we? What are we doing? You know? But, so that is a solution that most people, see so he says, the dilemma is often solved in this way, okay? But then he gives a warning too. Everyone can call to mind friends or schoolmates who were promising and idealistic youngsters, but who, when we met them again years later, seem to have grown dry and cramped in a narrow mold. These are the examples of the solution mentioned above, okay? So that is a solution to take responsibility, to go out, to limit yourself, and many times that's actually necessary. And that can still lead you to integrating and developing into, you know, the complete human being that you're meant to be. But at the same time, there's dangers of this solution has dangers, okay? It's one-sided. It, it can kind of dry you up and make you cramped, you know, like, um, because you've cut away from other potentialities of who you could be and who you could become. So you're leaving something out, you get it? You're leaving other things out so you can solidify some type of coherent consciousness, but you are leaving out the other aspects of who you are that aren't integrated in you, you see? And so, the serious problems in life, however, are never fully solved. This is important. If ever they should appear to be so, it is a sure sign that something has been lost. Okay? So you're always meant to have this, this tension between the opposites. The meaning and purpose of a problem seems to lie not in its solution, but in our working at it incessantly. Okay? So you're incessantly dealing with this conflict, this problem of the opposites. Um, and when it shatters, it creates a higher consciousness. But I, I guess, I don't fully understand what that means, but I know, you know, I have some kind of like inkling into what it means, but I don't, I can't really teach it because I don't know, I don't fully know, but I can feel it. Okay, so this alone um, preserves us from stultification and, and petrification. So also the solution of the problems of youth by restricting ourselves to the attainable is only temporarily valid, okay? And not lasting in a deeper sense, okay? Of course, to win for oneself a place in society and to transform one's nature so that it is more or less fitted to this kind of existence is in all cases a considerable achievement. Okay, so he's not saying it's a complete waste, he's saying it's an achievement. And so these lines are why I have a problem with, say, something like, um, the, not a problem, this is why I look at entrepreneurship, which is a creative thing in business and in the world, different from creativity proper itself. And it's because creativity proper is more of that number two personality. It's more of the unconscious, you know, the the that greater self, you know, the greatness of of that um, kind of pure creativity, you know. And business 
to me, or even entrepreneurship, it requires creativity and it requires a dabbling in the unconscious, but it also really requires a substantiation in business practices and principles, you know, supply and demand, you know, customer satisfaction. It is, um, you know, you're creating a niche in the marketplace, you know, it's serving the market. It's all great, that's great. But to me, it doesn't serve the ultimate ideal, you know, and I break it down like this. There's earning money for just being creative and creating stuff. That's basically, you're just who you are. You are, you're, you're like an artist, right? And you just create stuff and then the system rewards you because of who you are and you're kind of transforming the whole system with what you're bringing, the value that you're bringing. Yeah, so Jung married into wealth and he had a lot of money to um, pursue his study and, and do what he needed to do. And obviously he built up like his own practice and it was very popular. So he was successful in his own right. But, um, you know, anyway, that's a divergent thing. So I just thought that whole, those ideas from our other videos, uh, I can see them here too in the development of the personality in life. So the artist in life. And um, Jung does talk about that as well, eventually. Um, and so it is with the ideals, convictions, guiding ideas and attitudes, which in the period of youth lead us out into life, for which we struggle, suffer and win victories. They grow together with our own being. We apparently change into them. We seek to perpetuate them indefinitely. And as a matter of course, just as the young person asserts his ego in spite of the world, and often in spite of himself. Okay, so Jung there is, it's a warning. It's a warning against, he's saying it's formidable to go out there, win victories, do stuff, achieve stuff, but that is one-sided. That is external action. You know, it's not really like spiritual in a sense, you know, because um, he says at the end here, often in spite of himself. Okay, so he's doing all these great things, achieving stuff, winning victories. That sounds good, but it's often in spite of himself, his greater self. Okay, we overlook the essential fact that this, this, this is it. This, this is awesome. We overlook the essential fact that the social goal is attained only at the cost of a diminution of personality. See, to achieve what you need to achieve in the world you diminish your inner world you diminish your personality because you have to submit to the externalities to succeed you see many far too many aspects of life which should also have been experienced lie in the lumber room among dusty memories but sometimes too they are glowing coals under gray ashes see so all the things that you cut out and leave in the unconscious, that you cut out of your life, that are a part of you, that you leave dormant, um, they're either gonna be missing forever or they're gonna be bug you like these burning emberish coals and you're gonna be like these ashes on top of these, the second personality trying to come out, trying to be like, yeah, you've achieved all that in the world, but what about this? What about your soul? What about the, the inner world, the inner world of your life? Statistics show a rise in the frequency of mental depression in men about 40. In women, the neurotic difficulties generally begin somewhat earlier, okay? So that's what Jung has said there. So obviously we can see the same in our age. There's still a crisis with mental illness of people going, you know, having midlife crisis, not knowing what to do with themselves. And it's because they've seek, they've, you know, seek fulfillment in their life in only one way, only in the ego way of, of in society, but they haven't, they haven't um, sought inner fulfillment, which is a much more um, difficult thing to obtain. Now, so that's the period of youth, the second stage. Now go to the stage three at the adult years. So this is from 35, 40 and beyond and beyond up until before old age, before you're really old, okay? That, that's the fourth stage of life is when you're really old, okay? Um, so the adult years or the years of discretion, 30 to 40, an important change in the human psyche is in preparation, okay? Around that time because you're preparing to cross over to um, the end half of your life. 
At first, it is not conscious and, stri and a striking change. It is rather a matter of a matter of indirect signs of a change which seems to take its rise in the unconscious. Often, it is something like a, sh a slow change in a person's character. In another case, certain traits may come to light which had disappeared since childhood. Or again, one's previous inclinations and interests begin to weaken and others take their place. So basically, there was a restriction of the person's personality so they could achieve things. And now there's a retraction from achievement and a widening and opening back up of their personality again. That's the healthy version. But this is the negative version. Uh, conversely, and this happens very frequently, one's cherished convictions and principles, especially the moral ones, begin to harden and to grow increasingly rigid until somewhere around the age of 50, a period of intolerance and fanaticism is reached. It is as if the existence of the principles were endangered and it were therefore necessary to emphasize them all the more. So this is like the ego rejecting and, and being um, kind of dogmatic and rigid, trying to protect itself from, from the integration of the self, okay? So this person hasn't integrated in the younger years, in the period of youth. They didn't hold on to this tension and smash it and reach a higher consciousness. Instead, they're still now getting up to 50 and they're still doubling down on their ego, trying to submit things to their will, trying to gain pleasure out of life um, through external means. And so, um, and they're doubling down on their principles, doubling down on what they believe and what they think, and they're not allowing that second self to emerge, um, to, to emerge. Um, and so, um, it's like they're threatened, they're threatened by the end half of their life. Okay, so the very frequent neurotic disturbances of adult years all have one thing in common. They want to carry the psychology of the youthful phase over the threshold of the so-called years of discretion. So just as the, the people of youth, the, 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 um, the people in the stage of, of, of um, the youthful phase, they're trying to build, bring their childhood into the youthful phase, the people, the adults um, in the second half of their life are trying to bring the youthful, the youthful phase into the, the latter adulthood. And um, that is also, Jung says, that causes either someone who's very boring or someone who's neurotic. So the boring person would be like, remember the good old days? And he would just have his little plate and he would warm up his plate that he always uses. Like it's just some boring, kind of like he's lost that, that, that zest for life and he's stultified and stopped growing, okay? Because that, that's what makes him boring. Or neurotic, someone who shrinks back from the latter half of life and is always thinking about what could have been or what they're missing from their childhood because they didn't live enough throughout their life. And that's what Jung talks about um, a lot here is making sure you live you live life a lot, really. Like, make sure you live out all the things that you really want to live out in life. Otherwise, when you're older and you can't live those things out because you're not young anymore, um, you're going to regret it and you're going to just start wishing you were younger so you could achieve those things. But now you're older and your life is meant to be retracting, um, but you still want to be expanding in your life. So you got to make sure you integrate those things when you're younger. That's why he said it would be ideal if you could really reach that high level of consciousness in, in the youthful stage of life. And um, the descent means the reversal of all the ideals and values that were cherished in the morning. So he basically says life is like a sun that rises, reaches its peak, and then goes down. Okay, And so when you're like after 40 or whatever, you are now in the second phase when the sun is going down. It's no longer, it's past the peak or the purpose of it rising. Now your purpose is really to go down. And so, um, you know, you, the ideals change, the values change is, is what he's saying. That there's almost like this, this flipping of the values. So it's the integration of the opposite values that you valued when you were um, functioning under your ego. Um, and so he, he then invokes the ideas of the anima and the animus. He doesn't use that in this um, text, but you can tell he's talking about that. 
um, basically says that some women will develop more physical masculine features and some men will develop more feminine features and he says it can be observed in certain cases throughout the world i don't think he's saying everyone does that but in in certain um tribes and cases he, he's seen that um and there is and there's an interesting report in the ethnological literature about an indian warrior chief to whom in middle life the great spirit appeared in a dream the spirit announced to him that from then on he must sit among women and children, wear women's clothes, and eat the food of, of women. <laughs> so that's pretty interesting. Some transgender action going on back then. But um, that's good. Um, so there's that flipping, you know, um, you know the, the feminine and the masculine and all that. Um, we cannot live the afternoon of life according to the program of life's morning. For what was great in the morning will be little at evening, and what in the morning was true will at evening have become a lie. Aging people should know that their lives are not mounting and expanding, but that an um, inexorable inner process enforces the contraction of life. For a young person, it is almost a sin, or at least a danger, to be too preoccupied with himself. But for the aging person, it is a duty and a necessity to devote serious attention to himself. The illumination of the self is what Jung is talking about there. Okay, so, um, and yeah, he mentions that. So it can, that can tangle up a young person too, if they're too preoccupied with the self and they haven't, you know, forged an identity in the world. Um, you know, but if you've done that, then supposedly you can, you can illuminate the self at the same time as well at any stage of life. Um, probably not as a child though, um, who knows? <laughs> anyway, um, money making, so social achievement, family and posterity are nothing but plain nature, not culture. So you wouldn't trust the youth with that because they don't know what they're talking about. And you wouldn't obviously trust a child to bring culture or someone who was too old, who was kind of, you know, becoming unconscious again. Um, but so in the latter half of life, he's talking about um, the purpose should be to bring wisdom and create culture, really. Um, but we must not forget that only a very few people are artists in life, that the art of life is the most distinguished and rarest of all the arts. Whoever succeeded in draining the whole cup with grace. <laughs> um, so for many people, all too much unlived life remains over. Sometimes potentialities which they could never have lived with the best of wills. So they approach the threshold of old age with unsatisfied demands which inevitably turn their glances backwards. And so, yeah, he's talking about um, those artists who are actually artists of life itself. And so that's why I was talking about that other thing between art and, and all that stuff. So you can be an artist of life itself. It's rare, but you can do that, you know, and you want to drain the cup, um, drain the whole cup with grace. That's what you want to do with life. So you want to experience a lot. Um, don't hold back from doing the things that you know you want to do, you know, and so don't be so rigid. Let it all out, you know, um, and yet. Yeah, because otherwise you'd be glancing backwards. And that reminds me of Lot's wife. You know, in, in the Bible, Lot, um, you know, they're escaping Gomorrah or whatever it is, Sodom and Gomorrah. They look back and, oh no, Lot's wife looks back and God turns her into a pillar of salt. So there's something about looking back that's dangerous. You know, it's not good. You know, you don't want to look back. It is particularly fatal for such people to look back. For them, a prospect and a goal in the future are absolutely necessary. So Jung says, in older life, you need a goal. You still need a goal, okay? I have observed that a life directed to an aim is in general better, richer, and healthier than an aimless one, and that it is better to go forwards with the stream of time than backward against it. As a doctor, I am convinced that it is hygienic if I may use the word, to discover in death a goal 
towards which one can strive. And that shrinking away from it is something unhealthy and abnormal, which robs the second half of life of its purpose. I therefore consider that all religions with a supra mundane goal are eminently reasonable from the point of view of psychic hygiene. So he says before this that, you know, scientifically, we don't know what the hell really happens after death. Okay. But he's saying, when I observe my patients, um, they're believing in some purpose beyond this, some aim and goal in life while they're alive and beyond an aim and goal for death itself as well, somehow seems to be psychologically healthy for them. Okay, that's his observation and that's what he's saying there. Even though he doesn't scientifically, no one knows really what happens after death. Okay, um, so either way, you should have a goal in life, in your, in your latter half of life. Um, and it would be good if you could share the wisdom um, of the mysteries with the rest of us. So you still have a purpose at the end of your life, um, but it's a different purpose, you know, and it has a different type of aim and a different type of goal for the first half of life. Um, and so that's what Jung's talking about there. And then the fourth stage, old age, he basically just says, um, while it's very different to when you were a child, it's, it's similar in the sense that now you're becoming unconscious again. Okay. While in the last, um, while in the last, in extreme old age, we descend again into that condition where, regardless of our state of consciousness, we once more become something of a problem for others. So we don't have problems anymore in our old age. We're a problem for someone else because we need to be cared for. We're going to die. Really, we're suffering, um, and this is how he refers to very old age. Sinking again into the unconscious. So that's what it is. We're, we're sink, sinking again into the unconscious at the end of our life. So that's it, guys. I hope you enjoyed the four stages of life by Carl Jung and that I illuminated a little bit of thinking around those ideas as well. I'm going to keep studying and keep releasing more videos um, on various topics. Jung, maybe other things as well. For now, um, thanks for watching. Please subscribe. Please share this with someone just to help my channel. Um, and also, you know, they might like this content as well. So I'll see you in the next one.